Yeah, okay. Dear students, welcome to the second lecture uh, in this series uh, about electronics for physicists. Um, I think this is a bit too loud. Close at least this one. Um, yeah, first thing I'd like to ask is, are there any questions about the content of the last lecture? So what we did is, uh, well, basically went through a few basics and then uh, started with network analysis uh, according to Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, this was the example we looked at in the last lecture. And given that it's only two voltage sources and three resistors, it ended up being already relatively complicated with uh, this expression here, for example, as one characteristic um, formula for what's going on. Okay, any questions? Okay, if not, then I would like to continue in the, the same route. We basically came up with uh, different equations um, based on Kirchhoff's laws and then tried to solve the system. And this is the ad hoc method where you just write down all the equations you can and then just try to find a solution. And it's, it's possible to do that a bit more structured. Um, this is especially useful when you want to solve larger networks or, uh, for example, when you want to program a computer to do it for you. Then, of course, a, a structured um, method, how to get all necessary equations uh, is important. And uh, so there are two methods how to do that. Um, the node voltage method is the first one we are going to look at, this one here. Um, so what you regard here are the potentials at the nodes. So a node is uh, basically a, a cable between two components. So this is a node, this is a node, this is a node, this is a node. This is a node, and uh, so we, we, we need to, to define electric potentials um, at, at each node, and it's forbidden to have two components with no node in between. And then we compute all the potential differences as a function of the currents. So for resistors, this is simply an application of Ohm's law, as you can see, for example, here. So we take the difference between potential at node two and potential at node one, uh, and this is simply the uh, resistance R1 times the current. So we see this here, this is node two, this is node one, um, and uh, of course the current th going through this resistance produces a potential difference between these two nodes. Um, the sign convention is important, um, so you have to, to pay attention. If this side here is positive, this means the potential in node two is larger than in node one. So we have a higher voltage here than here. And this means that according to the technical current direction, the current has to flow from two to one. So parallel to the error that we've uh, drawn here. And so this side here also has to be positive. And uh, like that, you can go through all the other resistors. That's the same uh, just for the other resistors. Um, for a voltage source, of course, the difference in potential between uh, well, the two nodes uh, across the voltage source is simply the voltage that this source produces. Now, um, in order to solve the whole system, we have to define where zero is, because otherwise we just have relative uh, voltage differences. And in this case, we define uh, node zero to be at zero potential and then all the others uh, are well-defined. Okay, um, now we can um, use the equations we just got. This is a copy of what we've seen before. Um, extract the currents and uh, simply identify that, that those uh, potential differences here are just the, the voltage of the voltage source. And then we need one more input and that's uh, the current law in one of the nodes. Um, then we input all this into those um, and very quickly find a uh, solution that is the same 
as um, the one we've just seen in, in the example of last lecture. Um, this is the same thing as we've seen in the last uh, lecture if we've uh, identified this uh, voltage difference or the, the potential in, in node one um, with the current uh, that we calculated there um, simply scaled with this R3 resistor. Okay, so this of course leads to, to the same answer and uh, it's, it's a bit more in a structured way that's, that's easier to do if you have a large complex network um, and uh, it's easier to program uh, if you want a computer to do it for you. Um, the next method is the mesh current method. So again, just a, a way of uh, uh, systematically generating enough equations to solve the system. And uh, what we do here is we have a look, we, we subdivide the complex network, uh, well, of course, this one is not so complex, but uh, if you have a more complex network, you subdivide it into meshes. A mesh is, uh, well, uh, components and, and connections that go around in a circle. Um, so in this one, we have two meshes. And uh, now we say, okay, all currents that flow in this network can be decomposed into mesh currents. That's always true. Um, if you have a, a flat network, if you, if you can flatten it out like this one. And uh, so this, this means uh, we can write, for example, this current I3 as the sum of these two currents because it has a, an edge here which uh, connects to two meshes. Um, here again, we have to um, conserve signs in a well-defined way. Um, and so we, and we have to define a, a sense of rotation for each mesh, and it has to be the same for the whole network. Um, so for example, if we define this clockwise uh, rotation here, then we see I1 um, is parallel to the sense of rotation, so it's, it's positive. Um, I2, this, this current arrow here is anti-parallel to the sense of the rotation in, in this mesh, so it's counted negative. Um, and uh, I3, here we have a contribution from this mesh in a positive sense, and we have a contribution from this mesh in a negative sense. Um, so it's IA minus IB. Okay. So we, we um, expressed all relevant currents in the system in terms of the mesh currents. Okay, and then the method simply says that you apply the voltage law in each mesh, which means um, that you go, if you go around the mesh in the sense of rotation, uh, pointer, um, like this one, then uh, you, you count all the voltage drops or, uh, or voltage sources. So for example, in uh, mesh A here, we have to count the voltage drop across resistor three. And this one contains uh, the mesh current A minus the mesh current B because there's those two make up current I3, as we said here. And uh, we count minus the voltage in the voltage source because it's against our mesh direction and plus um, the current in resistor A um, times the resistance, just Ohm's law. We do the same thing um, for mesh B, and then simply uh, rearrange this to have the voltage sources on one side. Um, and here you see something systematic, and that's, that's nice about that method, um, that you can easily cross-check if you got all the signs correct. Um, and the, the thing is that in mesh A, um, everything that is related to current A uh, must contribute with a positive sign, and everything that is related to current B must contribute with a negative sign. In mesh B, we see the same thing. Everything that is related to the mesh current of that mesh, so IB, uh, contributes with a positive sign, um, and everything else contributes with a negative sign. Okay. Um, 
So again, this uh, can be written as a matrix, as you can see, um, the, with the resistors given the matrix components. And uh, we find the same um, kind of solution um, shown here. And of course, if we convert um, the difference between current A and B into current 3, we find uh, the same solution as we've seen before. So this is simply a different method to generate enough independent um, equations to, to solve the system, and uh, it's advantageous if you have a network with relatively large number of nodes and a relatively small number of meshes, uh, because then it gives you relevant equations uh, much quicker than going through all the nodes and, and subtracting or adding all those voltages. Okay, um, let's do a different example with the mesh current method. And this example is the um, Wheatstone bridge. So this is a well-known uh, electrical circuit consisting of five resistors um, arranged in, in this way, and it's called a bridge because there's this resistor bridging the, the two um, strands here. And so we have uh, three meshes. We define mesh currents, all with the same sense of rotation. We identify all the currents in the system in terms of mesh currents, which is uh, simple. So uh, current through, through this resistor here has a component from uh, current A and current B. Um, and then you have to count them in um, the correct, uh, with the correct sign. Um, resistor 2 only has a component from current B. Same is true for resistor 4 and so on. And then uh, we go around in each mesh and uh, add up all the voltages and we directly express them using Ohm's law in terms of currents and resistances. So this is done here. Um, equals zero, of course, uh, according to Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law. And then we have a, a nice uh, system of equations. We bring the voltage input to one side, and then here we have only resistances in this whole part and um, currents. And this means we can again write it as a matrix and solve it. Um, you see that already, I mean, this is not a much more complicated system than we had before, but it leads already to, uh, well, of course, a larger matrix and to much more complicated solutions. As you can see here, this already uh, is quite messy. Now, what is important about this, um, so this is, this is the, the full solution. Um, what is important about this uh, system is that, or how it's used is, that this resistor here is typically a very large one. So for example, a multimeter, a voltage meter, that measures the potential difference between here and here. And uh, if we have a look at the expression we just got, if we let R5 go to infinity, then this term here, of course, dominates, and in the um, uh, down here, the, uh, this term here dominates. And the rest then can be neglected. And uh, so this leads then to a much simplified solution. So if we divide this voltage 5 that we've seen here, this one, voltage across resistor 5, um, if we divide that by the supply voltage, then we get a nice impression, expression, sorry, um, shown here. Using the approximation uh, I just mentioned, it looks like this. And then we can extend this expression uh, by adding and subtracting the same term here. And then it decomposes into this nice form. Um, this is the form in which you, you use the Wheatstone um, bridge. But uh, be aware this is an approximation if your voltmeter here 
does not have a high input resistance, then this won't work, or it won't be as accurate as this uh, formula suggests. Um, the bridge is used typically to measure a resistor, so this means that you, you would use uh, four, uh, three uh, known resistors and then connect one unknown resistor. And then, of course, you can, you can solve this for the unknown resistor. It's particularly nice if you know the rough range of the resistor you are expecting. So, for example, you could use a resistor that is temperature dependent. So there are, the, for example, the PT100 uh, resistors that have 100 ohms of resistance at zero degrees. And then with temperature, this resistance rises with rising temperature. Um, and so you know that uh, you expect a resistance somewhere around 100 ohms. So you can have the resistor one um, already as, I mean, you can set it to whatever you want. Um, so you can set it to 100 ohms. And then at exactly 100 ohms, uh, this um, difference here becomes zero. Yeah, so it's a nice way to compare one resistor to a reference resistor and get a zero signal in case they match. And this is, for example, nice if you want to build a temperature controller. Yeah? So you could use the resistor one to set the temperature that you want. Um, resistor two is sensing the temperature that is in your system. And then when the, syst uh, when the temperature is too high, you get a positive signal as this this voltage difference. Um, and if the temperature is too low, you get a negative signal. And then it's very easy to decide what to do, switch on the heater or, or turn on the cooler or whatever. Um, so this is, a, this is a nice way um, to get, right, to translate the thing that you want, um, the set point into a, a zero crossing of a signal. Okay, um, there's one more way to do circuit analysis, and uh, this is the superposition method. And this is, well, it's useful in cases when you have more than one source. Because the superposition method um, basically says everything is linear in our network uh, consisting of linear components and sources. And in this case, we can um, regard the contributions of the different sources independently. So let's take this, this example. You ha we have a voltage source, we have a current source, and two resistors, and interested, or we are interested to calculate the, the current that flows through resistor number two. So if we do this in the normal way, um, we use uh, the current law. We see here that uh, in, in this uh, node, um, the two input currents add, and that the current across um, resistor one um, is related to uh, the voltage in the voltage source. Um, if we add Ohm's law for resistor two, we find this expression, um, well, and uh, we, can, we can solve it to, to show this form. So um, again, as we see here, it depends linearly, so it's, it's a term just using resistors to scale this voltage, which contributes to the current. And we add to that another term, again, some scaling factor uh, due to the resistors uh, times the current in the current source. Yeah, and now because of this linearity, we can um, simplify the analysis. So how does that work? Um, so, we go through each source separately. In this example, we just have two. Um, but, I mean, it could be several voltage sources and several current sources. And uh, so you pick out one source at a time. The one that you pick out, you leave in your, in your um, schematic. And all other voltage sources are replaced with short circuits. And all other current sources are removed. So if we do this for our voltage source U0, um, then there are no other voltage sources, so nothing to do, and we'd simply remove the current source 
um, that was before here. And now with this simplification, um, we simply see that there is a contribution to this current, I2, um, that scales like the voltage and then um, divided by the sum of these two resistances. Um, if we do the same now for our current source, so the, the rule for uh, current sources is uh, the same. We replace all voltage sources with so, uh, short circuits, so this we've done here. And we remove all other current sources, there are none. Um, and now we see that uh, we have the current source and two resistors. Um, now what, what this current source does is, is easily determined. Um, we have the the two currents that, I mean, this, this current generated here splits into two currents um, according to the resistances. Um, and we can simply solve this for current two. Um, and then we find again that uh, we have this uh, scaling factor um, times the current in the current source. Okay, and then uh, we simply add up these two separate results and get the full result. Okay, that's uh, important Well, if you treat many, many sources. Um, it makes your life much easier. Um, it's also important to do other kinds of analysis. For example, if you do noise analysis, then you do exactly the same thing and you treat each noise source separately and in the end you, end up, um, you add up the noise sources. Okay, so let's uh, summarize circuit analysis. Um, as you've seen, um, it becomes relatively quickly quite messy. We, we get large equations um, that are complicated to solve and to get a nice analytic solution out of uh, such a circuit analysis um, becomes quickly very complex if, if the, the network is more complex than the examples I've, I've shown you. So, I mean, more than five resistors and, and two sources um, is kind of messy. So, in order to, to make it possible to analyze uh, more complicated circuits, um, we need to simplify the network into subsections. This is something we will look at later in this lecture. And um, it's uh, also um, very powerful to treat parts of the network separately. And uh, for that, Many concepts have been developed, for example, the two-port network uh, scheme, where you basically follow a signal through different components in your electrical system, and uh, you assume that each component does not act back on the one before. Um, this is a certain approximation, it's a typical approximation that we often do to make uh, things easier. just realized I can take off my mask. Um, okay, this makes things easier. Um, there are other approximations which are typical. Okay, so to summarize circuit uh, analysis with Kirchhoff's laws, um, there is the ad hoc method um, where you simply use the current and voltage law to gain enough equations um, and then solve the system. Um, and that's mostly what we're going to do. Um, if you're not sure how to get enough equations, um, there are the two methods. Um, the node voltage method. So use the current law um, to connect voltages and current for each node. Um, it's easy to use systematically. And um, it's, well, uh, it's good if you have a well, few um, nodes. Then the mesh current method um, uses the voltage law to get um, mesh currents. And uh, from there on you can compute currents in components. Um, it needs a planar network, so it doesn't work. For example, if you have a, a cube and you connect a resistor along each edge, this you cannot um, unfold into a planar 
network in an easy way. Um, or maybe you can, I don't know. Um, so it, it, it needs to be planar. And um, it's good if you have many nodes and few meshes. So um, it it's generates more easily a relevant equation if you have uh, a mesh in which you have many components, then you add up all the voltages in the, in the mesh. Um, and this gives you the relevant equation to solve the system much more easily than if you would use the, the node voltage method. Okay, and finally, there's the superposition method um, where you determine contributions um, from different sources independently. So that's, of course, advantageous if you do have different sources. Okay, are there questions regarding circuit analysis? Okay, I see none, so let's continue. Um, I just mentioned uh, the two-port system, how to think about an um, electrical system. And uh, now we do the, the first step, um, uh, we just take a one-port. So a one-port is defined as an as a network where, uh, well, you have two connections, and these two connections are uh, one port, so the two poles are one port. Um, we say that we, we apply a voltage across those two input connections to our network, and of course there's a current going. And since there's no other way where this current can go, the current that goes in must be equal to the current that comes out. Now we can depict this situation with a voltage source and uh, the current going in, coming out, and the potential difference measured across the two poles here. Um, the same thing can be depicted in this way, and that's much more typical for an um, electronic scheme, where you state that this node is, for example, connected to ground, zero volt potential, this here is connected to um, a voltage source, 10 volt potential, and then, of course, we have the same current and voltage difference um, that goes in. Um, this here was drawn using KiCad, um, the, su the system that we propose to, to use to follow this lecture. So um, from now on, I will show most of the schematics that we discuss here. Um, shown as, as uh, KiCad schematics, so that you get used to the, how, this, uh, how things look there. Okay, um, really, really simple two ports are if we consider a network of resistors inside this box. And so the simplest thing we could do is adding um, many resistors, and in order to solve that, we will need Ohm's law. Just let me remind you that the normal form to write it, so voltage equals resistance times current. Um, we can turn this around and write current is equal. Um, now we see, need a quantity that is uh, equal to uh, the inverse, <coughs> the reciprocal value of the resistance. Um, that's called the um, conductance. Um, so simply one over R times the voltage. Okay, but in this example, we need the resistance. Um, we have this uh, string of resistors here, for example, and uh, what we know is that the current that goes in goes through all the components. It has no other way to go and then comes out here again. Um, if we now close this um, line, so basically saying that this is zero potential and that this is a voltage source, it means that there is a connection where the current can um, go back into the voltage source. This is often not drawn in schematics. Yeah? Simply all points that have this symbol are connected to each other, and in principle, um, arbitrarily large currents can flow through these ground connections. And uh, voltage sources then are also connected to the ground connection, and uh, so the, the current path is closed via this, uh, well, not drawn um, connections. Um, but, okay, this means we, we do have uh, a mesh here, and we can use the voltage law that simply all those voltages have to add up 
and be equal to the input voltage. Then we use Ohm's law to convert those into resistances and currents. We know it's the same current, so we can uh, pull the current in front of the parenthesis. And then we simply call everything that is in the parenthesis the new resistance. And so this already looks like um, an Ohm's law for the combination of all those resistors. Um, and of course, in this case, we simply have to add up all the resistance values. So you see here uh, that the series resistance is the sum of all components. Um, and it's easy to uh, simplify this situation to a single resistor with just a value that is equal to the sum of all those resistances. Okay, the same we can do um, in a parallel connection. So here we connect uh, five resistors in parallel. Um, and okay, there's, there's a nice sy symmetry between parallel and series connections. Um, so typically what was a voltage before is now a current. What was a resistance is now a conductance. Um, and the rest automatically follows. So if we now the current is distributed in many paths, but we know that it's the same voltage across all those terminals because they are connected here by um, these, these schematic connections, which uh, have no resistance. Um, we know that the, the current that goes in must be the sum of all those currents. It, it has to distribute over those paths, so we can write the sum of all those currents equals I0. Then we use the conductance uh, form of Ohm's law. See that all the conductances here have the same voltage because the voltage across all the resistors is the same. So we can pull the voltage across <coughs> out of the brackets and then we simply call everything that is in the brackets the new conductance of this system and identify this as uh, um, again an Ohm's law for the equivalent circuit here. So this simplifies to that. And uh, in this case, we simply add all the conductances. Um, the more common form of this law, of course, is that one over the parallel resistance is equal to the sum of the reciprocal values of all the individual resistors. Okay, this should not be new to you. Um, so, but let's have a look at an example. Um, for example, this circuit here with uh, five resistors. Um, and we can, we can simplify this in steps. So the first step would be to say, okay, this resistor, this resistor, and this resistor, they are connected in series. So we can replace them with one single resistor. So we simply add up the values. This gives us 10 kilo ohms here. Then we see, okay, uh, the next step would be to combine these two as a parallel um, circuit. And uh, the nice thing here is if you add up in, in series, the resistances always get larger. Right? You cannot make the resistance smaller by uh, series connections. If you add them up in parallel, they always get smaller. So the smallest resistance that we have here is the 2.5K. Um, if we in parallel add 10K, then the result is two kilo ohms. So it gets smaller, which is clear since there is some current that can go through the other resistor here. Um, so it is increases the, the flow of current, which means a smaller resistance. And then simply we add these two values and find that the whole network is equivalent to one resistor of five kilo ohms. Okay, um, now this already brings us to the point where we can discuss uh, one really, really, really important circuit and that's the voltage divider. Um, it's, it's completely trivial. Um, it's simply two resistors and we, we measure the voltage across one of them. And uh, the voltage that we measure here is a fraction of the voltage uh, that we apply on the input. Um, and this uh, fraction is given by the resistors, of course. Um, this 
circuit is important because we will see it in, in the course of the lecture like 20 times, always in slightly different variants. Um, we can replace uh, one of the resistors with something else, for example, a capacitor or so. And uh, the, the formula that we will use to, to compute what's going on uh, will be always this one. So, uh, like many times I will say, this is like a voltage divider, but. Um, and so it's, it's important to, to understand the voltage divider once in, hit, in its complete glory. Um, so it's, it's really trivial in this case. Uh, we have an, an input voltage. The current goes through these two resistors. So um, it's clear that we can write the current as the, the input voltage, U0, um, divided by the total resistance. And the total resistance is simply, as we've seen just now, the sum of R1 and R2. And then uh, it's also completely trivial that the output voltage that we measure is um, the voltage drop across resistor 2. So it's the, the same current times R2. Now, if we solve that, um, I simply put the current expression in here, we find this expression. So output voltage is, of course, um, proportional to input voltage, scaled by um, well, this uh, fraction here, where the resistor across which we measure is always in the denominator, and uh, the sum of the two resistors is in the denominator. Now, let's have a look at a concrete example. Our input voltage is 15 volts. We choose uh, this resistor to be 9 kilo ohms. We choose this resistor to be 1 kilo ohm. This means that our total resistance is 10 kilo ohms. Um, it also means that we have a current of uh, 1.5 milliamps <coughs> flowing through both resistors. And then we can compute that um, the 1.5 milliamps that go through the 1 kilo ohm resistor here um, produce a voltage drop of 1.5 volts. So we have divided the 15 volt input um, in a 1 to 10 manner, um, simply by, by choosing this uh, kind of uh, resistor values. Um, for example, this is how you measure a large voltage. So the, the voltmeter um, that we will use in the exercises, they use exactly this circuit to um, divide down, for example, uh, 200 volts voltage, um, which would damage the device if we connect it directly to the um, system that displays the voltage. Um, like that, we can simply divide down a voltage. Well, it's uh, also called a voltage divider because um, you get like one fraction of the voltage if you measure across this resistor. Um, you can also, of course, measure across the other resistor, and then you get the other fraction. Yeah? So now we uh, have one-tenth of the voltage across this resistor, and then this means that you need nine-tenths um, if you measure across this resistor. So you can choose um, which fraction of the voltage you want simply by choosing across which resistor you measure. Um, Imagine that this is a variable resistor, then this can also be used to produce a variable voltage. Yeah, so you have a constant input voltage, um, this could be a <coughs> potentiometer, and then you can simply choose um, how much you want to divide your input voltage and generate any um, voltage between zero um, and the input voltage. And this is, for example, how the knob works that uh, controls the voltage on any power supply. Um, that is not digitally controlled. Okay, so important circuit. Um, let's do one more, slightly more complicated calculation. If we assume that there is an additional resistor here, for example, the internal resistance of our voltmeter, and uh, so I've, I've chosen it to be large, yeah, typical uh, internal resistances are in the range of mega ohms. So let's assume it's one mega ohm connected across here. And then this, of course, changes the values in our voltage divider a little bit. Um, we have to do the same calculation, simply uh, 
replace this resistance 2 um, with the new effective resistance 2, which is the parallel connection of these two resistors, given here. Um, and then we can follow through the same calculation and we find the same result. Simply replace resistor 2 um, with the well, new effective resistor 2 star, um, which is slightly changed. Now, how much does it change? We had a 1 kilo ohm resistor here, and we added a resistor that is a 1,000 times larger. Now, if we in, in parallel connect these two resistors, then this will change the resistor too. It will make it smaller, clear? Parallel connections always make resistors smaller. Um, by about uh, one thousandth. Yeah, this is simply this, this ratio of the two resistors. So instead of a kilo ohm, we get 999 ohms plus change. And um, this means that our total resistance also is short about one ohm. This means that our current that flows um, changes a little bit. Um, this is not a one per mill change, it's, it's uh, less. Um, according to this resistance. Um, but it means that the voltage drop across the resistor that we measure with the voltmeter um, is also smaller. And here you see, again, this changes by about one per mil. And so um, you have to know that if you want to do a precision measurement, then the internal resistance of your voltmeter um, can have a significant effect on the thing that you measure. And uh, this is one of the typical simplifications that we do um, in order to, to make circuit analysis easier, that we assume this resistance to be infinite. If, it's, if, there's <coughs> if that is infinite, then we go back to the situation we had before, where the formulas are easy and the, the values or this, this dividing ratio is ideal. Um, but, I mean, you see, uh, if, if you want to measure something which is like eight digits accurate, then uh, you have to take this into account because this is already um, a one per mil error um, in this case. Okay. Um, yeah, before the break, we can still do the current divider. We have already seen a current divider uh, in this lecture, and I, I brushed over it a little bit. Um, and uh, now let's, let's do it a bit more systematically. So if we have a, a current source that drives a current through two parallel connected resistors, um, again, to remind you, this situation is the same as this one, where I did not draw this return line um, to the, the source. Um, I simply uh, connected them all to ground, and this means the exact same thing. Um, yeah, what we see here is that the current um, divides between these two resistors according to the resistance values. Um, and we find the exact same um, formula than we had with the voltage divider if we replace resistances with conductances. So this is a nice sym <coughs> symmetric way to think about um, current dividers. So again, um, if you compare this to the voltage divider, this is a, a serial connection of two resistors, and we deal with voltages and with resistors. This is a parallel connection of two resistors. We deal with current sources and conductances. So this is like a, a kind of symmetry that always appears um, in, in many things, and it, it helps a bit to um, make sure that, that you get things right. Okay, um, there's one thing that we will often use, um, that a parallel connection of two resistors can be written as uh, this uh, formula here, or this, this symbol, uh, simply R1 parallel R2, which of course means that we add the values in this reciprocal way. Okay, let's take a break here, and then after the break, we uh, go to Mr. Tevinin.
Okay, um, let's continue. So the next uh, subject is the Thevenin theorem. And this makes uh, a strong statement about simplification of electric circuits. So it says that any linear two-pole, so this means an arbitrarily complex network of current and voltage sources and resistors. So, I mean, we, we calculated uh, a few, like five resistors, one source, three resistors, two sources, um, and this was already work to, to calculate that. Um, now, Tevenin says that you can have thousands of sources, thousands of resistors um, in, in such a network here. And then you, you, you connect it on, on two um, nodes of this network. And then the voltage that you get across this terminal and the current that flows here are the same than for a single voltage source and a single resistor. Yeah, so this can be a huge simplification. Um, and the, the reason why this is true is that as long as all the components are linear, the voltage that we measure here and the current that flows um, follows this, this linear relationship depending on how strong, I mean, what the resistance of this resistor is. Um, and Tivenin even tells you what the voltage of the voltage source and what the value of the resistor has to be, um, or at least tells you how, how to gain those values. Um, the voltage simply is gained in the situation when there is no current flowing. This, this means we apply an, an infinite resistor here and measure the voltage. And this is called the open circuit voltage. Infinite resistor is open circuit. Um, then we measure the short circuit current. So if we make the resistance here zero and measure the current, then the, the voltage difference, of course, is zero at, on this axis. And we see the highest possible current that comes out of the system. Um, and if we know these two things, then we can compute the equivalent circuit. Um, the voltage source simply generates the open circuit voltage. Clear, if this resistor is infinite, or if there's no current flowing, then the voltage drop across this resistor is zero. And so we simply measure the voltage that is generated by the voltage source. The short circuit current, um, if this resistor is zero, um, then the current is simply given by the voltage and the resistance. So we can compute the Thevenin resistor uh, as simply open circuit voltage divided by short circuit current. Um, yeah, so this can be a huge simplification and it's always true as long as you have linear components in your network and the network can be arbitrarily complex. Um, the, there's an equivalent theorem um, by Edward, not Edward Norton from, from Hollywood, but Edward Lavi Norton. Um, and it says that, uh, again, an arbitrarily complex network consisting of sources and resistors can be replaced by a current source and a parallel resistor. So again, we have changed from voltage to current. We have changed from, um, from serial connection to parallel connection. And then it's, it's easy to see that the components that you need in this equivalent circuit are um, related. So you can express the Norton current as the Thevenin current um, divided by the Thevenin resistor. And interestingly, it's the, the same value of the resistor that you need in this parallel configuration uh, than we had before in the serial connection. Okay, so these are the two basic forms for a linear source that you can have. 
Um, and that's important to know. Um, well, for this reason, you can, as long as, as everything is linear, approximate um, a voltage source always with a perfect voltage source and a series resistor. We already talked about the internal resistance of a um, non-perfect voltage source. And basically, this is the justification um, that as long as everything is linear in your source, this is a perfect model. Yeah. So you can have an, an arbitrarily complex voltage source, and as long as it's linear, it behaves exactly like this. And this is a perfectly models the behavior of the device in your lab. Same is true for current sources. Um, this perfectly models the behavior of a current source um, as long as everything is linear. Okay, now we can ask ourselves, um, so what we did not specify is the value of the load resistor. And we con I mean, we saw if we connect, uh, and if, if we do not connect anything, we make it infinite, then we get certain behavior. Um, we get zero current, but the largest voltage. If we make a short circuit, then we get the largest current, but zero voltage. Um, and somewhere in between, we can actually extract power from our source. And this is depicted here. So the power that we extract from the source is the voltage times the current, of course. Now we can use Ohm's law to convert that to voltage squared over load resistor or current squared times load resistor. And uh, here you see the computed power for a load res uh, for an internal resistance of two ohms as a function of the load resistor. And you see we get the maximum here exactly when the load resistor is equal to the internal resistor. Now, if we change the internal resistor to 10 ohms, we get the orange curve here. And again, it peaks when the load resistor is equal to the internal resistor. So our assumption is we get the maximum power out of the source when the load is equal to the internal resistance. And of course, this can be proven. Um, the power that we get out of the source in this current and voltage diagram um, is the surface of this rectangle that just touches the characteristic curve here. Yeah, since it's uh, the voltage at a given uh, moment uh, times the current. And so the question is, where on this curve um, do we have to be to make this surface the largest value? Um, and so let's simply calculate the power. Power is current times voltage. We replace the voltage with Ohm's law, and we find again that it's the load resistance times the current squared. Um, now, we can simply compute the current. Um, this is simply a serial connection of two resistors driven by the open circuit voltage that's generated by the voltage source. Um, and of course, the total resistance is just the sum of these two resistors, zero connection. Um, so we can compute the current, given here, open, so <coughs> open circuit voltage divided by the sum of the two resistors. And then we can uh, immediately write down, uh, using this relation, what the power is. Okay. Standard technique to find the extremum, we uh, determine the zero crossing of the derivative. This is the derivative. In order to make this zero, um, we make the two fractions comparable. So we have to multiply with this term here. And then you see that for a non-zero open circuit voltage, that this has to be like that. Which again gives us the relation we just uh, assumed the internal resistance has to be the same as the load resistance. Um, so the maximum power that we can extract, we simply insert this into that, um, is the open circuit voltage squared divided by four times the internal resistance. 
And this is uh, in so far important if you want to protect your source. So for example, your source has a power limit. It cannot deliver more than 10 watts. Um, then you can artificially add an internal resistance um, in order to limit the power that can be extracted. And with this formula, you can uh, compute what the maximum power is. You can choose the internal resistance accordingly. And then no matter what you connect on the output, uh, it's never possible to exceed the power limit. Um, this is one way to make um, a source like foolproof. Um, so no matter what you connect on the outside, uh, you will not exceed the power limit. And it's the reason why the function generator that you will use in the exercises has an internal resistance. Um, okay, internal resistances are, are interesting uh, also in other lab devices. Um, this is a, a very, very simple setup. Um, I used the function generator and it told it to generate two volts, two volts uh, DC. And then I took a multimeter and if I measure what comes out, it shows four volts. Now, both devices are worth uh, several thousand Swiss francs and um, why does it not produce what I tell it to do. So is there anything wrong with the devices? Um, the answer is no. Does someone know what's going on? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, 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 very well spotted. Um, this one is set to 50 ohm resistance. And of course, a voltage meter has an almost infinite internal resistance. So um, what this voltmeter assumes is that we connect a 50 ohm load. And if we don't do that, then we get a different result. So let's have a look what's, what's going on here. We have the function generator with an internal resistance. And this internal resistance is 50 ohms for the reason that this is equal to the, um, the, the resistance of the cable uh, the impedance of the cable, and uh, if you do that, you can avoid reflections, and we will see in the exercises how that works. Um, and so 50 ohm internal resistance is a standard um, behavior for function generators because they expect to generate high frequencies and send them over long cables. Now, a multimeter um, is built for a different use case. Um, you want to have an internal resistance as high as possible in order not to, you've seen if we, if we connect a one mega ohm resistance to our um, voltage divider, we get already a one per mil um, change. Now this multimeter can display much more than, than three digits. So um, in order to get also uh, the last digit here correct, you have to have a really high internal resistance. So this is, this is almost infinite. And now what the, function generator does is it, it assumes that you connect 50 ohms. So these two resistors would build a voltage divider, a one-to-one -one voltage divider, um, which means here you get only half the voltage that would be the open circuit voltage. And so since the function generator is programmed that way, um, if you tell it to generate two volts in 50 ohm impedance, it generates four volts because it knows that it assumes that this voltage divider is in effect. And if you then connect something differently, you get a different result. So what was measured here is the open circuit voltage. And what was set here is the voltage that assumes that you have a 50 ohm load. <coughs> and it's a common mistake. And so if you ever see like twice the voltage coming out of your um, function generator, this is the case, you set it to 50 ohms. Um, and there is a different setting typically called high Z, and uh, then the, the voltage would be correct. Okay, um, next subject. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, do you have questions regarding resistors and networks?
Okay, if not, um, we go to energy in passive components. Now, if you've seen resistors, Widerstände, they convert electrical to thermal energy, they withdraw energy from a system, and uh, this is typically not reversible because of thermodynamics. Um, yeah, back, back converting um, thermal energy to, to electrical energy is not efficient. Um, capacitors are different, well, linear passive elements, and they reversibly convert electrical energy to an electrical field. Um, the field is, of course, proportional to the voltage that we apply to a capacitor. And so um, a capacitor is, is two electrodes um, between which we have an electrical field. Um, of course, technically, capacitors are built in a different way, but um, it's always two conducting surfaces. Um, often they are wound or, or um, connected uh, in, a, in a special pattern. Okay, inductors, um, spulen, they um, are also linear passive elements, um, and they again reversibly convert electrical energy, but now to a magnetic field. Um, this field is proportional to the current, um, and well, of course, uh, a coil typically consists of a wire that is wound around maybe a, a ferromagnetic core. Okay, so let's go into well, re resistors we've, we've dealt with. Um, let's go into capacitors and inductors. Um, aha, okay, first of all, resistors. Um, different kinds of resistors exist. Um, those are the smallest ones uh, for surface mount components. They are tiny, they can be tiny. Um, and then, as we said, resistors convert electrical energy into heat. And the more heat you, you generate in your resistor, the larger the resistor has to be because this heat has to go somewhere. If you generate the heat in a very, very small volume, then the resistor will just simply melt. Um, and so for that reason, uh, resistors are typically characterized by the power they can dissipate. Typical values are between one ohm and the mega ohm. Um, if you simply take a, a piece of copper cable with, with uh, six square millimeters, this is already quite a thick cable. Um, you get something like three milliohms per meter. This is uh, um, a small resistance, but for example, if you build very large installations, it's not <coughs> negligible. Um, and a good insulator, these are gigaohms, typically. Um, yeah, power dissipation of a, of a small resistor could be something like uh, a quarter or an eighth of a watt. So this would be resistors that look like that. And power resistors, like those ones, they uh, come easily up to uh, 100 watts. And of course, uh, you can also buy really, really big ones that go to thousands of watts. Um, for resistors, um, it's relatively easy to build uh, adjustable resistors. And basically everything that has an analog knob on it, um, so be it the volume control on an analog amplifier, um, the voltage setting on a, um, on a power supply, um, all those are uh, variable resistors because uh, capacitors and inductors are much more difficult to build in a variable way. Okay, um, this is what happens when you do not respect the power limit of resistors. Those are already quite powerful power resistors. Um, and what happened here is that well, a too large current was sent through them. Um, and they, you see this is a ceramic carrier where the, the wire of the resistor is wound on and this melted. Uh, and then the, the aluminum case here um, kind of exploded. So don't do that. Okay, let's come to capacitors. Um, well, have we seen uh, a capacitor is two electrodes that are electrically isolated from each other, so there's no, no direct current that can 
fl uh, flow through the capacitor. It's not, not like conductance. Um, but of course, if the capacitor is charged, then one electrode gets, uh, let's say, a positive charge. Um, and this replaces positive charges on the other electrode, which then remains negative. Um, and like that, the current, the current can flow through the capacitor. So while it's charging, um, charge carriers have to accumulate on one plate and then they um, basically um, repel the charge carriers on the other plate, which have to flow away from the capacitor. The characteristic uh, equation of any capacitor is that the charge on the capacitor is proportional to the voltage measured across the capacitor and the constant of proportionality is the capacitance of the capacity of the um, capacitor. The unit is farad. Farad, according to this equation, is charge per voltage. Um, okay, as long as the voltage is constant, there is no uh, current flowing through the capacitor, since then the charges don't change and uh, nothing is, uh, uh, no, no charges are pushed away or sucked into the capacitor. Um, the capacity, well, a very simple model for the capacity is that we have two plates um, at, a <coughs> at a distance D with a dielectric in between. And then we can see that the capacity is proportional to the area. So if you make the capacitor larger, uh, you get a higher capacitor. It's uh, inverse proportional to the distance. If you make the distance large, you get um, smaller capacity. Um, and then it's proportional to the um, dielectric constant of the medium between the two plates. Okay, and of course there's a constant uh, given here. Okay, um, similar to resistors, capacitors uh, can be easily combined in parallel and serial connections. Um, but it's just the opposite. If you connect them in parallel, the capacity grows. So here we have uh, five capacitors of uh, 100 nanofarad each, and the combination then gives 500 nanofarads. And it's easy to see if you assume that we simply connect the plates of the resistors, then connecting them in parallel makes the area larger, and so this give, uh, gives rise to an increase in capacity. Um, if we connect them in series, you can think about um, that this potential here is the same as the potential here. Um, and so, in effect, we simply increase the distance between the plates. And for that reason, um, the capacity becomes smaller if we connect them in series. Um, and we find the, the two um, laws according to the ones for resistors, um, just the reverse that we, for, for a series connection, we have the inverse law here. Okay, how do capacitors look like? Um, there are many, many, many different um, kinds of capacitors around. So for small electronic circuits, uh, surface mount capacitors like this, typically ceramic capacitors um, are used, but ceramic capacitors can also look quite different, like, like those ones here, and I think those ones are the ones we will use in the exercises. Um, they are bipolar, which means it doesn't matter um, it, to which um, terminal you connect uh, plus and minus. And um, they are suitable for high frequencies, so they can react very quickly to a change in voltage. But they are limited in the capacity that you can have. Um, much higher capacity you can buy for electrolytic capacitors. Um, they are unipolar, so it does matter where plus and minus are, and um, 
they are available only until medium voltages, something like 50 volts, for example. Um, but for, for that, uh, I mean, if, for example, if you want to stabilize the voltage of a power supply, those are the, the right capacitors. There are special kinds of electrolytic capacitors that go not only to millifarad, but to, to farad and even a thousand farads. So one farad is already really huge capacitance. A thousand farads is, is uh, a mangus. It can be used to, to store energy. For example, if you um, have a light on your bike that maintains uh, a certain, for a certain time, if you stop at the, the traffic lights, and if, if that is not based on an accumulator, it's probably based on a supercapacitor that is charged as soon as you start uh, rolling and then maintains the voltage for the lamp for uh, a short time. Um, Supercapacitors are only available for small voltages, typically 5 volts. So, for example, backup of an electronic circuit uh, is also possible with a supercapacitor. Um, then, film capacitors are well, somewhere in between. Um, they are available to medium uh, capacitance, they are bipolar, um, and they are available for large voltages. So if you have to, uh, if your circuit uses something more than 100 volts or so, then typically a film capacitor is what you need. Okay, now, um, what happens with capacitors if we use time-dependent voltages? So we, we have seen that um, for, there's no current flowing if the voltage is constant, so that's, a bit boring. Um, so what happens if the voltage is not constant? Um, we write the, the voltage now as a signal as a function of time. And then uh, we take the um, equation for the capacitor. Um, the capacitance itself is not time dependent. That's like a constant of the um, component that we have. So what's time dependent is the voltage and the charge. And uh, since this is true for the values, it's also true for the derivatives. Now, we can use this here, the, the time derivative of the charge, as the current. Yeah, this should be clear that um, if a current flows into a an capacitor, it charges up. Um, current is charge per second. So if we differentiate the charge, then this is equal to current. A change in charge is always uh, a current that flows in or out of a component. Okay, so um, simply identifying this as the current that flows into the capacitor, we can write um, that the current is equal to the capacitance times the change in voltage. Okay, now if we want to know what the voltage of a capacitor is in a certain situation, um, we have to integrate this and then uh, a voltage change is uh, always, um, well, of course we need the capacitance as a scaling um, factor, and then the time integral of the current. Okay, and this can be used to calculate um, how much um, energy is stored in a capacity. So let's have a look. Energy, work, oops, here is uh, the voltage times the current. And uh, we have to integrate that from zero to the time where we, uh, well, time to which we, we, where we want to know the volume. Um, the voltage signal is clear. Um, the current we can <coughs> replace with the derivative uh, using this expression. 
And then this is a variable substitu <coughs> substitution of the integral. So now we can integrate from zero to the voltage we're interested in um, over the voltage. And this simply gives us that the work is one half the capacity times the voltage squared. Standard expression, um, you find very similar expression for the energy stored in an electric field um, for the same reason that the energy stored in the capacitor is, of course, stored in an electric field. Okay, the next application of this uh, time-dependent um, characteristic equation of a capacitor is the RC circuit. So, if we have uh, this circuit here, let's assume we have a um, voltage source that produces a certain source voltage, a certain source current, and then this current goes through a resistor and then through our capacitor. And let me remind you that these two ground symbols here mean that simply this is connected to that. Um, here I've used different ground symbols um, just to show you that those also exist and mean the same thing. So, um, what we can do here is uh, use the voltage and the current law. Um, the voltage law very simply tells us that the voltage generated here must be dissipated by the resistor or the capacitor. So, the sum of these two must be equal to that and that all the currents are the same since um, there is only one path around which the current can go in this diagram. Okay, so this leads to um, this expression. So the source voltage is equal to the voltage in the capacitor and the voltage in the resistor already expressed using Ohm's law um, as the current times the resistor. Okay, now we use um, that the current um, is this expression. We can put this in and then we have two times the voltage across the capacitor, once in a time derivative and once uh, in its normal form. Um, and then we see that the only thing that actually relates to this circuit um, is the resistance and the capacitance and we define the time constant tau equals rc to make the equation easier. And then you see we find this differential equation here as the characteristic equation for the simple rc circuit. Now if the source voltage is zero then this is a very, very simple equation that we principally we can guess the uh, solution immediately because we have a function and then we have the time derivative of the same function scaled with something and the sum of the two has to be zero. So if we derive the function we have to get the same function with a negative sign and a scaling factor. And uh, the only function that is the same uh, after duration is the exponential function. It must be a negative exponent Otherwise, uh, these two would have the same sign and they wouldn't, be, wouldn't add up to zero. Um, and in the exponent, uh, we need a scaling factor that compensates the tau. So it has to look like this. Um, that the voltage in the um, capacitor is some integration constant that we are free to choose if we don't have any other information times this exponential function here. Um, and this is the equation with which uh, a capacitor is decharged. Yeah? So this assumes that we have charged the capacitor some time before we look at it, um, that this voltage is zero and it simply decharges through the resistor to ground and it does this in this exponential way. Now, if we want to solve the equation where we do have a source voltage, that's the inhomogeneous solution of the differential equation. Um, and uh, of course, you can solve that by hand in this very simple case. But I have to admit that I'm uh, too uh, lazy to do that. And so I typed it into Mathematica. So this is the 
inhomogeneous solution. Um, and this is the inhomogeneous solution. And you find that this gives um, very quickly the um, expression that one expects, um, which is that the capacitor voltage is equal to the source voltage times this term here. The one is, <coughs> is important because we, I mean, eventually, as soon as the capacitor is fully charged, the voltage across the capacitor must, must be the same as the voltage across the voltage source. Now, if we connect a 5 volt voltage source to the capacitor, we will charge it to 5 volts. So, for long times, this, this um, just becomes zero, and uh, we simply charge the capacitor to this voltage. Um, for the time before um, it's completely charged, we get this exponential approach of the final voltage. And let me show you how this uh, now probably we need a bit more. Can you see that curve? Um, I'm sorry that this is not really visible. There is there is a red curve here. Do, do, do. Ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. This is not really very well visible. The red curve here represents the charging of the capacitor. Um, so what I did is I took the same circuit that I've drawn in um, KiCad and added, well, used the simulation capabilities of KiCad to simulate what happens when this input voltage source steps from 0 volts to 10 volts. So the green curve here is the voltage above the voltage source. So in order to make something happen, we may have to make this dynamic. So I tell it to, to generate a pulse to go from zero to some voltage. And this I do um, with a spice command called, of course, pulse. Um, and then it has these three um, parameters, which simply says that it should go from zero volts to 10 volts at the time equal one microsecond. So you see it, it stays at zero at the really at the beginning and then steps immediately to 10 volts. Um, I've chosen some, some values, uh, 10 ohms for the resistor, a micro farad for the capacitor, and then you see the voltage across the capacitor, well, I hope you see, um, is this uh, red curve here. And you see it, it approaches this value of 10 volts um, in this typical exponential manner. In order to display this um, graph, I used um, the transient display function, um, which also has some parameters. Uh, in this case, it tells the system to simulate um, 100 with 100 nanoseconds of time resolution up to um, 100 microseconds. And uh, this then generates this nice graph. Um, an important characteristic feature of this graph is the initial slope. So how, how fast does the voltage rise here in the beginning? And this is easy to calculate. We simply take the, the formula we just had, um, compute the time derivative, and then we find that this is equal to the source voltage divided by RC, or the source current, the maximum current that the source can deliver divided by C. Um, so how do we see that this is the maximum current? I know I can use this one. If you assume that the capacitor is a short circuit, then the current that uh, flows is simply given by the voltage of the source and the resistor. And this is what happens at the beginning. The capacitor 
is basically a short circuit. Um, and the maximum possible current flows here in the beginning and charges up the capacitor. So the, the maximum possible current due, um, given by these two parameters. And then as, as the capacitor fills up with charge, the, the voltage drop across the resistor is less and less. And so the current that flows becomes less and less. Um, until the capacitor is fully charged and uh, there is zero current flowing. Okay, uh, until, of course, is, is, is not strictly correct um, because it takes an infinitely long time to approach this value exactly. Yeah. There will always be a small, 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 small difference. Um, and this graph here uh, shows how large this difference is. So if we start charging the capacitor at time zero here, um, and now we have I've shown time in units of the time constant. And I show voltage divided by the source voltage. So this is a completely dimensionless graph, and uh, it, it looks the same for every capacitor that you have and every voltage. Um, because it's scaled in, in this way. And then you see um, after one time constant, the remaining voltage to the, to the source voltage here, to the fully charged, um, is 37% of, um, of the source voltage. After two time constants, it's 14%. After three time constants, it's 5%. So you see that if you want to do, for example, a measurement that is accurate to 5%, you have, and you, you switch on your system and there is somewhere a small capacitance, then you have to wait at least five, uh, at least three time constants here, um, because uh, otherwise um, the capacitor in your system is still charging. Um, now you can ask, okay, 5% is not terribly correct. Um, so if I want 1%, you have to wait 4.6 time constants. If you want uh, a per mil, so uh, a 1 to 1,000 error, um, you need already to wait 7 time constants. And um, it continues that way. If you want to do um, a 1,000 times better than a per mil, so an error, of one part per million, um, it's twice that time, so almost 14 time constants. And uh, this is important. For example, if you have such a very nice voltmeter that gives you um, six digits of resolution, um, and there is somewhere a capacity in your system, then you have to wait a certain time before this value is completely settled to all the six digits. I mean, having uh, one PPM error here is just six digits. And um, now you say, okay, well then I don't use any capacitors in my system, then I'm infinitely fast. Um, this is also not true because there's always a small parasitic capacity, um, as one says. So um, it's better to know the capacity in your system and how fast a certain value is approached and just to assume that it's uh, instantaneous, which is never the case. Okay, um, next lecture we will talk about the RC circuit if we add additional loading capacitors. Um, that's it for today, unless you have questions. Okay, if not, thank you very much. Um, do we do the, the group um, splitting now? Yes, okay. So I hand over to you.
Okay. Good. So uh, here in this room, we will have the practical exercises, but uh, before we do that, we have to vent the room again. So I ask you to step out and we do the venting. <laughs> <laughs>